Saida Garrett, I'm glad that we could have this time to talk about a man who has played a very significant role in your life. That would be Mr. Quincy Jones, whose Indeed. life and career in music is being celebrated in two concerts this weekend at the Hollywood Bowl that you will be performing at both. So before we get into your own interactions with Quincy, I want to ask you about something he is quoted as having said. He said, I'm just a musician and a record producer. And that was it. That was the entire thing, how he described himself. And I'm reading that and I'm thinking that woefully underestimates and underserves everything he's done. I assume you agree with that. Yeah, but I think he it, it's it's his uh, modesty that that will allow you to sing his praises, but he will he would never. He would Why never not? be the one that said, I did this and I did that and I did I won this and I got this many Oscar nominations, and I this many Grammys. And he's not that guy. He other people say that about him, which is what I, I love. Well, take me back to that talent show where you were where you were discovered by Quincy. What do you remember most about that event? It was a, an open cattle call. It was a cattle call, and I remember um being so naive and not knowing really what I was getting into because um, I, uh, I had a friend who, who was a singer and her uh, she knew about the audition, but she didn't tell me. Her boyfriend told me the, the night before and he told me where to go and what uh, I said, okay, uh, what time do I, what time does it start? He said, I don't know. So I showed up at 7 a.m. And in the line uh, with me were two other people uh, but by noon, when the actual call was, the line was around the block, and it was at SIR in, in uh, Hollywood. And it was it was just an open table with with um, uh, clipboards on the table and, and dates and times that you want to audition. So you go up to the table and you fill in, you know, ten fifteen on Tuesday, ten thirty on Wednesday. You know, you fill in what time and date you wanted to audition. I said, I'm here now. I'm ready to do this now. I, I think I'm gonna just audition today right now. So I was one of the first people that they auditioned. And Quincy told me uh, years later that that was the bar. I set the bar. So in order to be in these auditions, you had to be as good as I was in those auditions or better than me. So it took literally nine months. I would get these letters every month or so. Congratulations, you're one of 500 for Quincy Jones's. Congratulations, you're still in the running. 250, 100, 70, 50, 20, 25, 10, 5, 4. And it was me and three other guys, and we became a group called Deco. And with that, uh, 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 deal came a, a an artist deal and a publishing deal now i had never written a song in my life i only wrote poems so i did not want the publishing deal i just wanted the artist deal so i think the guys had a meeting with quincy and he, their contracts were on the table and he said well i don't even know why i wasn't at this meeting we said where's saida's contract they said oh she doesn't want the uh publishing she just wants the artist contract Quincy kind of pushed their contracts back across the desk and said, you either all get this deal or nobody gets this deal. Next thing I know, Saida, bitch, you better open up this door and sign this contract. <laughs> Dude, when three large black men tell you to sign the contract, you tend to sign the contract. But I decided if I was going to sign that I needed to figure out how to write a song. How, how, what did it take? What was the formula? How do you do it? So I went about the business of studying songs. And because I was at those auditions, along with other producers, songwriters that were looking and, and, and writing songs to for Patty Austin, for Quincy to produce. So a bunch of songs started coming through me because I was the demo singer. And, and it was because of those, I Quincy just kept hearing my voice. And then long story short, I got, I, I auditioned for, for um, Sergio Mendez and ended up going on the road with Sergio. So 
that kind of made Quincy sign me because I was either going to sign with Sergio on AM as a solo artist or sign with Quincy with this group. So I made the decision to sign with Quincy and learn the, the craft of songwriting. And I was in the room, uh, 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 Dennis Lambert and Franny Goldie were in the room. Uh, Barry Mann and Cynthia Wilde were in the room when I was auditioning. I did the demo for Through the Fire for Shaka Khan. I, uh, 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 I uh, yeah, because Franny Goldie and Dennis Lambert were in the room, I did the demo for a song called Don't Look Any Further, which was meant to be a duet between Dennis Edwards, a former Temptation, and Shaka Khan. But they couldn't get the two in the room together. They couldn't get them together. So I put, uh, I did the whole demo and then Dennis Lambert put Dennis Edwards on to do his part. And then they were waiting for Shaka. And then somebody at, at Motown was like, where, we need to put this record out. Who was on the demo? Some girl named Saida Garrett. Fine, leave her on it. And it became like a classic R&B classic. So I just because of my involvement with Quincy, because of, of, the, of my my association with him and and me being in his vicinity, I was I was privy to a lot of opportunities, and those opportunities allowed me to sing demos for many different producers and songwriters. So I learned a lot about songs by doing those demos for these uh, producers and songwriters. Do you, do you remember the first significant conversation you had with Quincy? That's a great question. It would have have to it would have to have been in those early days when he was deciding to sign me. Yeah. What were there conversations where he was giving you advice, trying to figure out who you were as a person, as an artist? Oh, what? all the time, all the time. He he, you know, he would invite me to sessions. He invited me to participate on writing for Back on the Block. I met, you know, I met Ella Fitzgerald, Miles Davis, uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Sarah Vaughn. Uh, it was just incredible, an incredible learning experience. And I learned so much just by being in his aura, just in his space. It's a learning experience. He's an amazing human. He really is one of a kind. And he has done so much for the industry in which he's a part of that you you can't really speak about the music business without saying his name or without mentioning his involvement in some uh, artist's life in some way. I have to say, when you mentioned that you met Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughn, two women that I am old enough to say that I saw perform live, <laughs> you know, I just get goosebumps because those two women mean so much to me. That had to have been just... I mean, how do you how do you even structure a sentence when you're in their presence? <laughs> you don't. You just shut up and listen because they have a lot to say and and they have a lot of life experience that they just, you know, just being in the room with them, you you experience uh, it. The conversations are so rich and so enlightening that you just absorb. I was just a sponge, man. I was just a sponge in the room. Well, you know, there's that old expression, garbage in, garbage out. If you're around people like Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughn and Quincy Jones, you don't have to worry about the garbage. <laughs> well said. I'll take that. Yeah. You know, you talked about all the areas that Quincy, you know, was important, but I think a lot of people forget that he was also a film composer. Yes. And, and the countless scores that he wrote and how he broke ground as a black man writing film scores. I mean, I that's that was frankly the way I got into Quincy Jones was learning about the film scores first. Mm. Um, so it, his contributions, I think, you know, cross genres and cross disciplines, don't they? Most definitely. I mean, I, I'm embarrassed to say that when I auditioned for Quincy Jones, I didn't know who he was. I didn't, I, uh, I, I knew his music, but I didn't know that he was responsible for producing it. Um, and I didn't learn very much about him until after uh, I signed with him. Uh, and then I realized uh, the gravity of his participation in this world of music and how uh, big a participant he is. He's up until the last decade, he's been relevant in seven decades of music. 
and his relevancy has been super high in, in most of them. But the fact that he's been involved and and in producing and writing and playing music for seven decades, it's just, it's beyond, it's beyond belief. I don't know anyone else like him on the, on the planet. Well, and it, it would take somebody like Quincy Jones to get the kind of artists that are performing this weekend, yourself yes. included, obviously, to celebrate th this man and everything that he's done. What are you looking forward to most at these two concerts at the Hollywood Bowl? Hanging out backstage with all my peeps, my friends, all the people that I don't get to um, see very often uh, and hang out with. I, 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 I've been privy to many years, many decades of Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners at Quincy's house. And the beauty and joy of those um, events was that you never knew who was going to show up. I mean, I, I I remember Quincy's 70th or 60th birthday party. I was in the room with Barbara Streisand, Wilt Chamberlain, uh, Gregory Peck, uh, uh, Liz Taylor. It was just Diane Cannon. It was insane. It was insane. Just the people that want to be in his orbit. And I was just happy to be a little black fly on the wall, you know. <laughs> well, it's not only Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners that you've been a part of, but you were actually at Quincy's official 90th birthday dinner in March, I believe, yes, with like yes. Greg Fillingaines and Herbie Hancock and a whole bunch of other people. Yeah. So you get to be a part of the big public party, but what was it like being at the personal party celebrating his 90th? It was a lot like those Thanksgiving dinners. Um, some were uh super star studded and others were just close friends and family and this 90th was v very very close friends and and family and just the fact that he is still active and 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 I remember calling him at, after his his birthday or calling him a few days later and I was like Q um how you feel he said 90 so, you know, his sense of humor is still very, very active. And I just love listening to his, the, the stories that he has to tell about his life and his life's experience. He's a wealth of pertinent information and and uh, just good, good observations and good things that he's experienced in his life that he could impart uh, on others that he he speaks to and mentors and um, teaches on a daily basis. He's a teacher. I think all the best artists are. I agree. Now, well, I don't know. Maybe yeah. Maybe by example. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll give you that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Th look, there are some flawed, flawed artists. Let's let's face it. There are some people, you know, who you just sort of go, God, I love what they do, but my God, what's going on with you? Yeah. And that's throughout history. That's yeah. not just today. That goes back hundreds of years. He's managed to keep the 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 grit and the 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 dirt of the this business pretty. He's managed to keep himself pretty clean as far as that goes, which is a testament as to the kind of person that he is. Because there's a lot of dirt in the movie business and the music business that he just, you know, he just sort of brushes it off his shoulder. He doesn't get in involved or he hasn't been involved in those kind of things very often. Yeah, it's best to be Switzerland sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say the Swiss, yeah. Yeah. Now, you at the start of this conversation, you mentioned that you didn't know anything about songwriting, um, right. you know, when they asked you about a publishing deal. But it's not just that you've written songs. You've written songs with Quincy Jones. Yes. What did you learn about who he was as an artist through that collaborative process that maybe was unique that you didn't know until you had, had you know, taken that step into, into co-writing with him? Um, I, I, I think I, I learned that I didn't know he could play piano because he never played piano in my presence before, but he started playing when we were writing a song for the, uh, I think it was the World Games in in or the World Expo in Shanghai. Uh, we wrote that song uh, together for that, and he 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 really is meticulous about chords and notes and and the sequence 
and he, he is a master of, of, of song structure. So I learned a lot about vocal arrangement and song structure from him. I'm, I'm sorry, my phone's ringing. Okay. So I, I just learned a lot about watching him go through the process of, of making music and writing a song. And what happened with us is we just sat in the room together and he just started, you know, playing some chords. And then when he got the chords together, he, he sent the, 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 the track to a, a musician who could really flesh it out and, and add more structure to it. And that became uh, our song. I think that was the first song I wrote with him for the um, World Expo in Shanghai. Was that I Know I Can or Better City, Better Life? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, we did both. I'm, yeah, I'm not I know sure you did. Which, which. One was the World Expo and then the other one was the World Games or something. I, I'm not I'm not sure. Well, it must be nice to see the credit for those songs have your name side by side. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, the Probably the song that you've written that people know best is Man in the Mirror, which you co-wrote with Jeff Ballard. Jim, uh, Ball uh, Jim Ballard. Glenn. Glenn Ballard. Ballard. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. I don't know who Jeff Ballard is, but he wishes he I had don't either. He wishes he had those royalties. And I don't know who Jim Ballard is. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but can you tell me what, the, what that moment was like when Quincy told you that the song was good enough that he was going to take it to Michael Jackson? Man, let me tell you, it was it was crazy because Glenn and I wrote the song and and I took it to Quincy's house and I gave it to him on a cassette and I said the only thing I asked just just get back with me as soon as you can. He said, "All right, all right." So, I go home and I'm cooking dinner and I get a call from Quincy like 2 or 3 hours later after I let I'd left his house. And he said, and I quote, "Sid, this is the best song I've heard in 10 years." And I'm like, and then he said, but, and then I didn't really want to hear nothing after best song in 10 years. I just wanted to live in that moment. So he said, but, but it, I didn't really hear what he was saying, but I think he said something. We've been in the studio with Michael for two and a half years. He has yet to record a song he didn't write. I don't know, Sid. And then he said, but don't worry, Sid. If I don't record this song for Michael on this record, which was the bad album, then I'll do it with James Ingram on my album. And I'm going, <laughs> hmm. I had to let it go. I said, Michael Jackson, James Ingram, Michael Jackson. No, I had to let that go. And, and it didn't really matter because the song was going to do what it was going to do anyway. I had no control over where it ended up. Come to find out a couple of days later, Quincy calls again and he says, we're in the studio recording your old piece of song. And I'm like, yes. And then he said, but I'm listening. We're in the studio recording your song. That's all I want to hear. We're in the studio recording your song. He said, but Michael has a problem with the chorus. He said, the chorus is the, hold, hold, hold on. And then I hear, and then, then, and then Quincy gets back on the phone and says, and Michael really wants you to bring home the the, the idea of the, hold, hold, on, hold on, Sid. And then I hear, and, and Michael, hold on a minute, Sid. Quincy Jones then puts Michael Jackson on the phone. Now, I don't know about you, Craig, but when I was coming up, Michael was my husband. My other cousin had Jermaine, my other cousin had Tito, but Michael, well, that was my husband. So in my mind, I'm on the phone with my husband, but I didn't want to be fangirl. I didn't want to go, oh my God, oh my God, let me sit by to listen to your music. You're so good to me, I love it. I, I wanted to be the antithesis of fangirl. So I got on the phone like a hotel operator. How can I help you? First thing Michael Jackson said to me was, I love this song. I'm like, thanks. The second thing Michael Jackson said to me was, and I love your voice. I'm like, so he goes on and he talks about he needs the song to be to, to, to twice as long. So we I extended the course, but I didn't want Michael Jackson to have to come up with any lyrics. 
for this song. So I wrote out six different stanzas for him to choose from. And the lines he chose was, you got to get it right while you got the time, because when you close your heart, then you close your mind. So at that point, I knew they were recording my song and it was going to happen. And then a few days later, Quincy called me in to do the recording session. Um, and I thought we were going to uh, put the, I thought this was the choir session. I walked in the studio and, and I heard another song playing. So I said, oh, uh, they must be running behind. So I'm going to just sit and knit. And I'm sitting behind Quincy knitting. And this song is on uh, on the, the speakers. And he turns around and he says, Sid, do you like this song? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He said, can you sing it? I said, yeah. He said, well, go on in there and sing it. Michael, go on. And I get up and I start to go into the booth and Michael starts following me into the booth. Um, and he's following me. Wait, I'm getting confused. Okay. He's following me into the booth and there's two music stands. One microphone, two music stands, and, and on the music stands is the sheet music, and the song's called I Just Can't Stop Loving You. First verse, Michael. Second verse, Saida. Third verse, Michael. And it was in that moment that I realized, oh, my God, I'm singing a duet with my husband. I was just. It, that moment was so, it was like everything was moving in slow motion. I couldn't believe that I was getting ready to sing face to face, a duet with Michael Jackson. It was insane. Now, what if when Quincy said, hey, Sid, you like this song? What if I said, meh? Eh. I never would have been on that song. And I would assume that no matter what level of excitement or nerves you had going through there, your perfect pitch, you know, was was flawless at that oh, moment. No, I don't have perfect pitch. No, oh, that's I know what I read. I read you had I don't perfect, have perfect pitch. pitch. I just wanted to do the best that I could do for my husband. You know what I mean? I just wanted to be my best for my men, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's it's too bad that Michael isn't still with us so that he could be a part of this weekend. But if you were to sort of have a fantasy about what Quincy's 90th would be like with Michael participating, what do you think that would be like? We would be singing Man in the Mirror to Quincy Jones. That's what that would be like. That would be amazing. Now, for those who think that, that work stops when you're 90, Quincy Jones is proving that wrong <laughs> because you are collaborating with him on yet another project, which is the upcoming film version of the Color Purple musical. Um, so if you could, can you tell me a little bit about your involvement? Yeah, the film, yeah. Um, I was invited to participate uh, fit to finish uh, some a couple of songs that were in progress before our dear Allie Willis uh, left the planet. May she rest in peace. Um, and they invited me to, you know, write a song or, or for this film and I did. And, you know, Quincy's ex executive producer along with Oprah, uh, but he wasn't in studio when we were doing the music, but th that is, um, I didn't even think about that. That is yet another collaboration with Quincy Jones. You're absolutely right. And that could also potentially bring that piece of hardware that is not currently on your desk to a prominent <laughs> place there too, right? I'm ready for that little gold man in my life, yeah. I mean, you know, third time's the charm, right? I From your lips to, to the God's ears. <laughs> well, let me, let me finish this thoroughly enjoyable conversation by concluding with something else that Quincy said. Um, which he said is the advice that he always gives to his protégés. He says, always have humility when you create and grace when you succeed, because it's not about you. You are a terminal for a higher power. As soon as you accept that, you you can do it forever. Is that advice he ever gave you? And if he if he hasn't, I assume that's something that resonates with you, regardless of whether he had or hadn't. That is advice that I've, I've heard for uh, the last 30 years from him. God. 
I can't believe I said that. It's been 30. I was just a child at the time when we met. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's been, he's, you know, he has these isms, the Quincy isms that he just, little pearls of wisdom that he drops uh, on you when the when the situation uh, permits. But I learn something every time I'm in his presence. And it, if it's not a life lesson, it's a dirty joke. If it's not a dirty joke, it's 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 uh, uh, it's something that uh, that happened to him that he couldn't believe or that 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 is unrealistic in other in the lives of regular human beings. I mean, he's just um, he's a treasure. He really is a, a national, an international treasure. I'm glad to be a part of his life in some small way. Yeah.